Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, great to be here today. Uh, my name is Bryson Katona. I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Pennsylvania, where I serve as the director of the Gastrointestinal Cancer Genetics Program. And today I'm very excited to be talking to you about what's new in pancreatic cancer screening and prevention, a topic that I'm extremely passionate about. I think it's a very important one as well. So before I start, I'd just like to take a minute to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to come and give this talk today. Here are my disclosures, uh, none of which are pertinent to the talk that I'll give today, other than that I did work with Immunovia on the PANFAM trial, uh, which will be mentioned in the talk today. So today, just to give you a little overview, I'm gonna first talk about pancreatic cancer risk, then we'll move on to talk about who should undergo pancreatic cancer screening, methods of pancreatic cancer screening, and then the outcomes of this screening. And then lastly, we'll close out with a little bit of discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on pancreatic cancer screening. So first, let's talk a little bit about pancreatic cancer risk. So pancreatic cancer actually is not a very common cancer, but it is a very deadly cancer. So when looking at new cancers amongst men and women, uh, you can see that it's the 10th most common cause of cancer amongst men and the ninth most common cause of cancer amongst women. However, when you look at cancer deaths, it's the fourth most common cause of cancer-related death in both, both men and women, soon to be the third most common, as I'm sure it will pass colorectal cancer in the next couple of years. However, lifetime risk of pancreatic cancer in the average risk person is fairly low, only about uh, 1%. Now, when we look at pancreatic cancer uh, deaths over time, what we can see is that when we look at other cancers, the death rates from cancer have been decreasing. So if you look at lung cancer in the red here, if you look at prostate cancer and colorectal cancer, those death rates have all been uh, decreasing over time as we're getting better at preventing cancer and also at better at treating cancer. However, if you look at pancreatic cancer, which is the orange line here for both men and for women, you can see that those rates are, are actually climbing, um, thus indicating that, that we certainly have more work to do to develop better treatments and prevention for pancreatic cancer. However, one bright spot is that early stage pancreatic cancer uh, people are surviving much longer after that diagnosis. So if you look at stage 1A and 1B pancreatic cancer, what you can see is over the last decade or two, the survival rates for those individuals are going up uh, extensively. So back in the mid 2000s, it was only about a 50% five-year survival. Nowadays, it's, it's over at or over 80% uh, five-year survival. Thus indicating that if we can catch pancreatic cancer at a very early stage, people are going to do much better with our current uh, available therapies. Now thinking about what percentage of pancreatic cancer is due to familial or genetic risk, we think that that fraction is about 10%. So the majority of pancreatic cancer is what we would call sporadic, meaning not related to any known family history or not related to any known uh, genetic predisposition. Of this 10% that's related to family history or genetic predisposition, 7% uh, is related to familial uh, pancreatic cancer or, or strong family histories, whereas 3% is related to genetic predisposition. So what is the, the risk re regarding family history and or genetic predisposition? Well, in terms of family history in the absence of a genetic mutation, uh, the risk really is proportional to the number of individuals in the family that have pancreatic cancer. So the more individuals that have pancreatic cancer in the, in the family, the higher the risk for pancreatic cancer for the other members of that family. And when we look at pancreatic uh, cancer risk related to uh, genetic mutations, what we can see is that there are many genes that are associated with increased pancreatic cancer risk, including many of the breast cancer susceptibility genes, such as BRCA1 and BRCA2, ATM, as well as PALB2, as well as some of the Lynch syndrome genes. And then there are other uh, less frequent uh, genes that less frequently seen genes that, are, that also contribute to increased pancreatic cancer risk. All right, well, let's move on to uh, talk a little bit about who should undergo pancreatic cancer screening. And before we talk about that, let's first talk about uh, what makes a good pancreatic cancer screening test. And really a good pancreatic cancer screening test should allow for 
earlier detection of a cancer or a precancer. It should permit an inter intervention to be performed because this cancer or precancer was detected earlier. It should ultimately improve survival from, from cancer. And it should not create more harm than good. And so if a screening test uh, helps one person but harms 10 people, it would not be considered a good screening test. And finally, a good pancreatic cancer screening test should be cost effective. And because it's a very high bar for any pancreatic cancer screening uh, to pass, um, it has actually came out from the US Preventative Services Task Force that pancreatic cancer screening really is not recommended for average risk asymptomatic adults. However, this of course does not include individuals with strong family histories and or genetic predisposition. So when we think who is eligible for pancreatic cancer screening, really we consider those with a lifetime risk of pancreatic cancer of at least 5% as the, the core group that we would want to be eligible for screening. And there are many guidelines out there that, that uh, provide some guidance as to who these groups are, including from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, from the International uh, CAPS Consortium, and then also from many different professional societies, including the, the American College of Gastroenterology. However, all of these guidelines do have slightly different recommendations uh, about which age groups, uh, which, which uh, subgroups of, of patients uh, should undergo pancreatic cancer screening. But I'll try to break them down into a few uh, larger categories for you. So the first category really is what we would consider familial pancreatic cancer. And this is where there is no known gene mutation in the family, but there are two relatives in the family with pancreatic cancer. These two relatives need to be directly related to one another, and then individuals eligible for screening are then directly related to one of these two individuals. Typically, it's recommended to start at age 50 or 10 years younger than the youngest pancreatic cancer that is diagnosed. There are also uh, mutation carriers such as BRCA1 and 2 carriers, ATM carriers, PALB2 carriers, and uh, individuals with Lynch syndrome. Uh, in this particular case, the, it's recommended that an individual is eligible for pancreatic cancer if they have one family member with pancreatic cancer, either a first degree relative, which would be a, a parent, a sibling, or a child, or a second degree relative, such as an aunt or a grandparent. And again, the, the age to start is, is the same. And then finally, we have several groups of individuals that are eligible for pancreatic cancer screening, regardless of family history, including uh, Poit-Jager syndrome, car carriers of a CDKN2A mutation, and individuals with hereditary pancreatitis. Now, just going back to the family history requirement for the BRCA1 uh, and 2, ATM, PALB2, and Lynch syndrome carriers, uh, in this particular case, what we don't know is what about screening individuals who do not have a family history? So basically mutation carriers in these genes that do not have a family history of pancreatic cancer. And I think this is an important point as, as basing whether or not someone is eligible for pancreatic cancer screening based on family, family history can be impacted by many things such as a small family size. Um, so there may not be many relatives who are at risk for developing pancreatic cancer. Sometimes there's an unknown or incorrect family history, and so patients may not know exactly what their, their distant relatives uh, passed away from. And also, there can be early deaths due to other cancers or other causes. And this is especially true in families where there is hereditary cancer risk. Um, this becomes incredibly important, such as, say, for example, BRCA1 family, where individuals may have died early of breast cancer or ovarian cancer, and thus may have not reached an age old enough to where their pancreatic cancer risk would be substantially elevated. And it's also important to note that the majority of pancreatic cancers that develop in BRCA1 and 2 carriers, PALB2 carriers, and ATM carriers actually occur in the absence of a family history of pancreatic cancer. So given all of these uncertainties, uh, we started a, a clinical study at the University of Pennsylvania. It's now been recruiting for about uh, six years or so, uh, basically looking at pancreatic cancer screening and carriers of a BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, or ATM mutation who do not have a family history of pancreatic cancer. Um, and uh, we're excited to uh, 
say that uh, the, the preliminary results from this study were actually just published uh, last month in Cancer Prevention Research in this article titled EU, EUS-based pancreatic cancer surveillance in BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, and ATM carriers without a family history of pancreatic cancer. And in this study, I think we, we uh, try to illustrate that pancreatic cancer screening certainly can be considered in uh, these gene mutation carriers without a family history of pancreatic cancer. However, the effectiveness of this screening is certainly something that will require further study uh, down the road. So let's move on a little bit and talk about methods of pancreatic cancer screening. And uh, before you uh, embark on pancreatic cancer screening, I think it's really important to have an in-depth discussion about screening with, with an experienced medical provider who has expertise in this area, discussing the, the potential but uncertain benefits of screening, the risks of screening, and the limitations of, of screening. Now, when we think about uh, methods for pancreatic cancer screening, I'm gonna first talk a little bit about imaging, then we'll talk about blood work, and then finally, we'll talk about enrollment in pancreatic cancer screening studies. So when we think about imaging, this really is the, the, the mainstay for pancreatic cancer screening. And imaging should typically be performed on a yearly basis in at-risk individuals. This can be performed preferentially by either MRI or endoscopic ultrasound. Some patients will get yearly MRI, other patients will get yearly endoscopic ultrasound, whereas other patients may alternate back and forth between MRI and endoscopic ultrasound. There's been good evidence to show that both MRI and endoscopic ultrasounds are better than uh, doing CAT scans or CT scans or abdominal ultrasounds, and therefore these modalities are not recommended for pancreatic cancer screening. Now let's go through the pros and the cons of MRI and endoscopic ultrasound in a bit more detail. So the pros of MRI are that it's non-invasive, and also it's better for detecting cysts, which are small little fluid-filled uh, sacs that can be detected in the pancreas and are likely accounting for about one-third of pancreatic cancers that develop. The cons of MRI is that if a lesion is found, the patient will then need an endoscopic ultrasound, uh, the MRI does require gadolinium, uh, as there have been some concerns about gadolinium toxicity, especially for individuals who may be getting other MRIs for other reasons, such as breast MRIs. There's a high incidental finding rate with MRIs, so we, it's very possible to find other incidental lesions that may need additional workup or therapy, and MRIs are also very expensive. Now, when we think about EUS, or endoscopic ultrasound, the pro of EUS is that it allows for sampling of lesions of the pancreas during the same procedure. Furthermore, it's better at detecting solid lesions of the pancreas. And we think that solid lesions really uh, form the majority of pancreatic cancers and are responsible for about two thirds of pancreatic cancer. Now the cons are that it is an invasive procedure and does require some sedation. And there is some expertise dependency uh, to this procedure. And so when I'm sending high-risk patients for endoscopic ultrasounds, I wanna send them to a, a endoscopographer that's doing many of these tests uh, per day, not, not only a few of these tests per month. Um, there's also a high incidental finding rate with EUS and, and certainly it is expensive as well. Now, when it comes to uh, expense, there have been some uh, recent studies that have looked at the cost effectiveness of pancreatic cancer screening. Uh, this one published in 2009, uh, looked at abdominal imaging with MRI or EUS, followed by subsequent surgery if a lesion was identified. And it, this particular study did find that pancreatic cancer uh, screening in high-risk individuals uh, was cost effective under this model. Uh, this was a report that was just recently published two months ago from, from our group, where we looked at the cost effectiveness of an index endoscopic ultrasound in high-risk individuals. And what we found was that an index, high, index endoscopic ultrasound was also uh, cost effective. So when it comes to imaging, really, I think annual imaging uh, is, is necessary. My personal practice is to start individuals uh, with an endoscopic ultrasound and then either continue endoscopic ultrasound on a yearly basis or alternate between endoscopic ultrasound and MRI. 
Now let's talk a little bit about blood work as well. So there has been some uh, reports of CA199 as being a potential uh, screening test for pancreatic cancer. However, um, there have been there have not been conclusive studies to show that CA199 is helpful, and thus at this time it is not recommended that CA199 levels be checked on a regular basis. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, screening for diabetes, looking for elevated fasting blood glucose um, or hemoglobin A1Cs. We'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And then I'll briefly mention the IMRE uh, PAMCAN-D test. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, diabetes and the link between diabetes and pancreatic cancer. Uh, what, we've, uh, what we know is that individuals who have hyperglycemia or diabetes um, these individuals uh, may have the hyperglycemia or diabetes uh, develop right before the pancreatic cancer and actually be maybe potentially the first sign that a pancreatic cancer uh, is, is developing. And so I do think it's reasonable to uh, screen for elevated blood, blood, blood glucose levels and diabetes in individuals at increased risk for pancreatic cancer. Uh, the other test that I want to briefly mention is a test by Immunovia uh, called the IMRE PANCAN D test. Uh, in this particular test, uh, patients have a blood sample drawn. This is then run on a, a proprietary microarray platform, and then patients are then given a report about whether or not uh, they have a positive or a negative test. Uh, this test was subject of a large international study called the PANFAM study. Uh, this was done with centers in the U.S., but then also centers throughout the world, and we at Penn were, were one of the U.S. centers that participated in this study. Although this test is, is now clinically available, we're still waiting for the results from the, from the PANFAM study. Once we get those results back, I, I'm hopeful that this test will be able to be incorporated into um, pancreatic cancer uh, screening for high-risk individuals. Lastly, I'll just mention that en enrollment in pancreatic cancer screening studies is, is very important for individuals who are undergoing pancreatic cancer screening, as this will allow us to collect more data to, one, determine what test are, is the best for pancreatic cancer screening, uh, will help us also determine who are the best candidates for pancreatic cancer screening, and if, and if there are any other risk factors uh, that we may or may need to take into account for pancreatic cancer screening. And so I'll just mention two studies that are ongoing and actively recruiting, uh, both of which uh, we are participating in at the University of Pennsylvania. The first is the CAPS-5 study. This is a National Cancer Institute uh, funded study, um, the longest uh, and largest NCI funded pancreatic cancer early detection study uh, in the U.S currently. Uh, there are eight sites uh, who are participating, primarily uh, located in, in the Northeast. Um, and this particular uh, study has uh, been going on now for, we're in our sixth year of, of recruiting um, with, uh, um, you know, hopefully many years to uh, continue recruiting uh, in the future. Uh, the other study that I'll briefly mention is the PROCEED study. This is run by the Pancreatic Cancer Early Detection Consortium. Uh, we also participate in this one at the University of Pennsylvania, and there are sites all across the U.S. as well as across the world who are, are participating in this study. This study was originally funded by, by Project uh, PURPLE and has been recruiting now for about a year. And so these are two uh, great studies. Um, there, are, there are many other studies that are, that are out there, but I do think it's important for individuals who are undergoing pancreatic cancer screening uh, that they participate in uh, pancreatic cancer screening studies, uh, which will undoubtedly help inform uh, their future screening down the road. Now let's talk a little bit about pancreatic cancer uh, screening outcomes. Um, so, you know, what do we want to see from uh, pancreatic cancer screening? Well, you know, we want to, pancreatic cancer screening should allow us to detect pancreatic cancers at an earlier stage. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we really want to increase survival from pancreatic cancer. And then we also want to make sure that pancreatic cancer screening does not lead to harm. And when we think about pancreatic cancer screening, really the major harm that we're, we're concerned about is the need for unnecessary surgery. As pancreatic surgery is certain, certainly a, a risky surgery that has substantial morbidity. So there have been a few reports that have looked at pancreatic cancer screening outcomes. Uh, this was a report from a European group uh, from 2016 that looked at about 400 patients at high risk of pancreatic cancer. 
The majority of these patients had a very high risk of pancreatic cancer gene mutation called the CDKN2A uh, gene. Um, what they found was that in their CDKN2A carriers, about 7% developed pancreatic cancer over the course of the study. And what they found remarkably was that of the cancers that were detected during screening, 75% were resectable, which is a really phenomenal rate, as usually the percent that are resectable is only around 10%. Furthermore, the five-year survival was uh, about 24%. And for pancreatic cancer, usually the five-year survival is, is around 5%. So again, both of these numbers were uh, substantially improved over what we would typically expect. However, in this study, they did find that 12 patients actually underwent a pancreatic surgery for what was called a low-risk lesion. And so therefore, these individuals may not have necessarily needed to really undergo pancreatic surgery. And furthermore, there was no control group for a comparison in this particular study. Now, more recent data from uh, uh, another European group that was just published earlier this year looked at about 360 patients at high risk for pancreatic cancer. Um, and what they found in this particular study was that they showed, they found that, that endoscopic ultrasound was better at detecting solid lesions of the pancreas, whereas MRI was better at detecting uh, cystic lesion cystic lesions. Um, they also found uh, 10 patients in their study who developed pancreatic cancer with 60% being resectable. Again, this is a much higher rate of, of resection than would typically be expected for pancreatic cancer. However, of the 17 patients who underwent surgery, about half of them did not end up having a high-risk pancreatic uh, lesion, uh, there, therefore uh, demonstrating that some of these individuals underwent surgery uh, without a, a high-risk lesion being present. And furthermore, there was no control group for comparison. So the final study I'll, I'll highlight is uh, what I think provides really the, the best evidence uh, for the, the benefits of pancreatic cancer screening. And this is a study uh, out of Johns Hopkins, uh, which looked at about 350 patients who were under, at increased risk for pancreatic cancer who were, who were under, being followed, many of whom were undergoing uh, screening. What they found was that the rate of progression to pancreatic cancer uh, or to other high-risk lesions was about 1.6% per year. And when they compared those pancreatic cancers that were detected during screening compared to those detected outside screening, they saw a remarkable difference between the two groups. So for those pancreatic cancers detected during screening, they found that 90% of those pancreatic cancers were, resect, were, were surgically resectable, whereas those detected outside of screening, only 25% were surgically resectable. Furthermore, when they looked at survival at, at three years, they found that, that those detected during screening, 85% of those individuals survived three years uh, or, or more, whereas those detected outside of screening, only 25% survived uh, three years or more. And so to me, this, this is uh, 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 the most convincing uh, data that, that pancreatic cancer screening in high-risk individuals uh, done, of course, in a multidisciplinary uh, program where there is expertise in pancreatic cancer screening certainly has potential to identify pancreatic cancers early, allow more to be surgically resected, and ultimately improve survival, which is the ideal outcome that we want to see from pancreatic cancer screening. And in the last couple of minutes, I just want to briefly talk about the impact of COVID-19 on pancreatic cancer screening in high-risk individuals. So we know that uh, COVID-19 in general has affected so many things uh, in all of our lives, uh, but it did have a dramatic impact on cancer screening, especially during the initial pandemic shutdown uh, of, 20, uh, of 2020, in, in the spring of 2020. Uh, during that time, looking at the rates, uh, the decreased uh, rates of uh, mammogram, prostate cancer screening, colon cancer screening, cervical cancer screening and lung cancer screening, you can see there are major reductions in all of these uh, different, different screenings during the initial COVID-19 pandemic shutdown. And this translated into uh, decreased cancer diagnoses. And so we are seeing uh, uh, you know, less breast cancer diagnoses, less prostate cancer diagnoses, uh, less colon cancer diagnoses, cervical cancer and lung cancer diagnoses as well. However, what was not known is how the COVID-19 pandemic would affect pancreatic cancer screening amongst high-risk individuals. 
And so this is a question that we tried to answer through our, our CAPS-5 con consortium. And we had this uh, paper that was just published uh, several months ago that looked at COVID-19 related pancreatic cancer uh, surveillance disruptions amongst high-risk individuals. And so across our CAPS-5 consortium, we looked at about uh, 700 individuals who were undergoing pancreatic cancer screening via endoscopic ultrasound and found that 16% of this cohort actually had an endoscopic ultrasound scheduled uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic shutdown from the spring of, of 2020. Of these 108 patients who had an endoscopic ultrasound, almost all of these procedures were, were canceled. So 97% because of COVID-19. We found that 83% of patients were actually rescheduled for pancreatic cancer screening six months after the lifting of, of restrictions related to COVID-19. However, 17% of patients uh, were not rescheduled by six months, thus highlighting that there's a subgroup of patients uh, that, that you know, really had their screening uh, significantly delayed because of COVID-19. Now, we don't know if this has resulted in any, any uh, long-term um, uh, negative effects, but certainly it is important that for all cancer screenings, including pancreatic cancer screening, uh, that, that we get high-risk patients uh, back in and get these screenings done in a timely manner. We did find that having a prior history of cancer was actually associated with an increased likelihood of, of rescheduling as well. So hopefully today I've given you a good overview of pancreatic cancer screening and prevention and some of the, the new advances uh, in this field. This is a very uh, exciting area. It is an exciting area that a lot of people are working on both across the United States and, and, and throughout the world. Um, it's an area that certainly uh, needs, um, needs more funding, um, but I think that is the case with uh, many areas in, in uh, uh, cancer-related research nowadays. So I thank you so much for your, for your time. I hope that you found this, this talk helpful, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the, the FORCE uh, annual meeting. Thank you again.